The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad is the final of the package films Disney produced in the World War II era, and it's probably the best of the bunch. While the other movies were somewhat hit or miss with their segments, both featurettes here are excellent, even though the characters of Mr. Toad and Ichabod Crane have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Like Fun and Fancy Free, both the Wind in the Willows and the Legend of Sleepy Hollow segments were planned as full-length features, but cut down and spliced together for budgetary reasons. To start our villain rundown, we'll take a look at the Weasels and Mr. Winky from the Wind in the Willow section. The Wind in the Willows was written by Kenneth Graham about four animal friends that live along the riverbank. Mole, Rat, Badger, and Toad. Some sections of the book are slice-of-life stories about Mole and Rat, while the Mr. Toad sections are much more comical and adventurous. The Disney version naturally leans into Toad's exploits, as they were no doubt more fun to animate. Toad is a rich adrenaline junkie who hops from obsession to obsession, his main one in the book being motor cars. After buying and crashing several cars, Toad's friends lock him in his room in stately Toad Hall to try to snap him out of his destructive habits. Toad escapes and immediately steals a car, leading to his arrest and imprisonment. Toad is able to break out of jail and leaves a merry path of destruction as he makes his way back home, only to find that a band of weasels, ferrets, and stoats have taken over Toad Hall. He, Mole, Rat, and Badger fight the intruders off and reclaim Toad's ancestral home. The weasels, ferrets, and stoats are from the dark and mysterious wild woods, and are implied to represent Britain's lower class. Although they are said by Rat to be untrustworthy, until the final chapters of the book, they really don't do much of anything, other than menacingly peer at Mole when he gets lost in the woods. The Weasels and their cohorts ultimately play a rather small role in the story, but since the battle for Toad Hall is such a memorable climax, the book's adaptations sometimes give them larger roles as more solid antagonists. Often, the Stoats and Ferrets are dropped as well, leaving only the Weasels as the villains. Some early concept art by Disney does show that they are considering using the Stoats as well as Weasels, however. In the Disney version, most likely in an effort to make Toad a bit more likable, he does not steal the car that lands him in trouble. Rather, the car has already been stolen by a gang of weasels, unbeknownst to Toad. Toad sees the weasels park the car and enter a pub run by Mr. Winky, a new character added for the cartoon. He is so taken by the car that Toad immediately offers to trade it for the deed to Toad Hall. The weasels, of course, accept, and Toad is soon arrested under suspicion of being a thief. When Toad calls Winky to the stand to vouch for his account of what happened, Winky claims Toad tried to sell him the stolen car, resulting in Toad's imprisonment. As it turns out, Winky is the leader of the Weasels, as opposed to their chief in the book, who is a weasel himself. Winky and the Weasels, of course, take up residence in the newly acquired Toad Hall. Like in the book, Toad breaks out of prison and joins his friends in battle to reclaim his home, although this version merely has them attempting to steal back the deed as proof of Toad's innocence. The two weasels who briefly speak are voiced by Leslie Dennison and Edmund Stevens. Winky is voiced by Oliver Wallace, who is better known as the composer of many Disney films and shorts that came out around this time. In addition to writing countless underscores, Wallace also wrote a few well-known Disney songs, like Pink Elephants on Parade and Following the Leader. Winky was one of his only acting roles, although he is heard later in the movie, providing Ichabod's nervous whistling in the forest. The weasels and Winky are all well-designed characters, despite not having a lot of screen time. They all give off an aura of untrustworthiness, something that Toad ignores due to his motor mania. The shifty, trigger-happy weasels and Winky's smug grin, something akin to a stereotypical used car salesman, are dripping with personality. Winky appears to be a very small person, since the animals, for the most part, are drawn in their actual size and scale compared to the other humans who appear in the cartoon. The size discrepancy is carried over from the book, where Toad is said to be more or less the size of an actual Toad, yet he can convincingly imitate an old woman to escape from prison, not to mention drive cars, albeit poorly. The scene in which Toad and friends try to reclaim the deed in Toad Hall is wonderful and well-paced. Animation fans might recognize some of the animation of the deed switching hands as being redone for the Jungle Book later on, when Baloo and Bagheera try to save Mowgli from the monkeys. According to animator John Ewing, the scene's reuse was Jungle Book director Wooly Reitherman's idea, and while converting the weasels into monkeys was fairly easy, drawing Rat into Baloo and a piece of paper into Mowgli proved to be nearly impossible. As you can imagine, when Disney's Wind in the Willows went from being a feature-length film to a portion in a packaged film, lots of material ended up getting cut. 
Although I could not find much about what was left out of the Sleepy Hollow segment, a nice amount of storyboards for the Toad Half have made their way online. In the lengthier cut, the weasels would have been seen gloating at the pub about how they had just robbed a bank, and the red car that attracts Toad was actually their getaway car, though it's unclear as to whether or not it's stolen in this version. They leap at the chance to make Toad their patsy here. The storyboards for Winky's account during the trial show some terrific exaggerated poses and faces from the barkeep, with him appearing much more openly devious. There's also a shot of him discreetly flashing the deed at the amused weasels, who are also present at the trial. The battle at Toad Hall would have been different as well. The river bankers would have tied up a pair of weasel cooks in the kitchen. Toad is left to stand guard, while the others search for the deed. Toad, being Toad, is distracted from his duty, tempted by the Christmas pudding the weasels have made. While he eats, the weasels escape and attempt to stab him. The commotion alerts everyone else, and the fight breaks out. When the river bankers escape with the deed down the secret tunnel, they are cut off by Winky and the weasels. Winky snatches the deed back. In what would have been a rather dark scene, the river bankers are lined up against the wall, and the weasels prepare to shoot them, like a gangland execution. At the last moment, the bloodhounds tracking the escaped toad arrive, followed by the police. In a last-ditch effort, Winky tries to burn the deed, but he and the weasels are ultimately arrested. That was pretty much the end of Winky's career, both in the story and in a grander sense. Aside from appearing in a beloved theme park attraction, which we will cover later in the video, Winky has not been seen in any notable roles after The Wind in the Willows. This was not so for the weasels. As the years have gone by, the weasels have managed to, for lack of a better word, weasel their way into the Mickey Mouse and Friends continuity, usually playing the roles of henchmen. This all started way back in 1952, where a weasel appeared as a crook in the goofy cartoon How to Be a Detective. After this, the weasels would largely remain dormant for about 30 years, but their time would come. In 1983, a pair of weasels appeared as gravediggers in Mickey's Christmas Carol. They are discussing Scrooge's death, filling the role that a group of businessmen played in the book. Although they come off as a bit sinister, this is one of the only examples of these characters in a non-evil role. They are voiced by Wayne Allwine and Will Ryan. Allwine voiced Mickey Mouse in this cartoon for the first of many, many, many times in his career. Ryan, meanwhile, voiced nearly a third of the characters in the short, also playing the Big Bad Wolf, Mole, Willie the Giant, and Pete. Weasels appeared in henchman roles in a few DuckTales episodes shortly after this, serving characters like Flintheart Glomgold. A special group of five weasels notably appeared in Who Framed Roger Rabbit as the dreaded Toon Patrol, working for Judge Doom. These wonderful villains deserve their own entry, since there's a lot to say about the Toon Patrol alone, and I couldn't talk about them without talking more about Doom. We'll be seeing more of them in a future entry. The cartoon series Bonkers, which was inspired by Roger Rabbit, featured its own weasel, Wacky Weasel to be precise, voiced by the King of Confetti, Rip Taylor. In the Bonkers verse, Wacky starred in a series of his own cartoons, where he constantly evaded the police. Although it's not directly stated, this seems to be his inspiration for turning to real-life crime. He's obsessed with eggs, and sets out to steal as many as he can, be they valuable Fabergé eggs, or just the ordinary supermarket variety. Still, he seems even more obsessed with the chase as a whole, and being an obnoxious tune, since he mostly dumps all the eggs on Bonkers and his crew. A notable appearance for the Weasels was the 1990 featurette The Prince and the Pauper, which also happens to be one of my all-time favorite Mickey Mouse cartoons. A seemingly infinite number of identical Weasel guards serve their corrupt Captain Pete. They were all voiced by Charlie Adler and Bill Farmer. Listen closely to what they're singing when they first appear. It's a spoof of the Mickey Mouse Club march. The Weasels would appear here and there in the Mickey Mouse Works cartoons featured on the House of Mouse, where they would often play roles of shifty salesmen and lawyers. In one episode of House of Mouse, Pete boasts that he can do a better job of running Mickey's club. Mickey challenges Pete to try it himself, and Pete hires his villain friends to help out. Of course, none of the villains are helpful, and the weasels who act as waiters are more interested in stealing from guests than serving them. These weasels were voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson and Jim Cummings. The weasel's most recent animated appearance was in the wonderful world of Mickey Mouse. In the western-themed episode Cheese Wranglers, a group of weasel bandits served Pete once more, again voiced by Bill Farmer. Despite their rising prominence in animation, the weasels never had much of a presence in Disney comics. 
Most likely, this was because the countless comic continuities out there had their own large casts of characters to choose from, villains included. The roles the Weasels filled in cartoons could easily be played by characters like the Beagle Boys in the Donald Duck comics. In Mickey Mouse comics, Pete's henchmen were often played by comic-exclusive crooks and thugs, like a recurring pair named Scuttle and Dum Dum. Even if you don't know these two by their names, if you've read even a few Mickey comics, you've probably seen them at least once. The Weasels have fared a bit better in video games, where they once again are usually working under Pete. In The Great Circus Mystery, for instance, Baron Pete wreaks havoc throughout the land pretty much just because. Three different Weasels serve as mid-bosses along the way, including a fire juggler who even made it onto the game's cover art. Oh, and despite the game's name, only the first level really has anything to do with the circus. For some reason, that bothers me more than it should. In Mickey Mania, the weasel guards from The Prince and the Pauper appear in the final level, which is naturally based on that very cartoon. A single weasel appears serving Pete in Magical Tetris Challenge. The weasel and Pete's other henchmen, the Big Bad Wolf, try to steal gemstones from the heroes for Pete, and have to be defeated the old-fashioned way. By beating them in a game of Tetris, of course. The point-and-click game Mickey Saves the Day has Pete become mayor. If you choose to play as Mickey, the story will be about the real mayor, Minnie, being kidnapped. If you choose to play as Minnie, Mickey will be the kidnapped mayor. Either way, Pete naturally abuses his power, robbing the town's treasury, among other things. He has the weasels act as his enforcers, meaning players will have to deal with a number of weasel cops, construction workers, and factory foremen. The numerous weasels in this version were voiced by Charlie Adler, Wayne Allwine, Corey Burton, and Nick Jameson. The racing game Mickey's Speedway USA was notable for having the weasels as the main villains. The weasels kidnap Pluto for his diamond-encrusted collar, and Mickey and friends chase them across the country. Pete is a playable character here, and is not actually associated with the weasels for once. Why the weasels didn't just steal the collar and leave the dog somewhere is beyond me. The only explanation I can come up with is out of sheer nastiness, since the weasels send several postcards along the cross-country chase, each one showing them tormenting Pluto. In the end, the joke is on the weasels. They are sent to prison, and the diamonds in Pluto's collar turn out to be made of glass. This brings us to the weasels in the Disney theme parks. Not counting the Toon Patrol being featured throughout Roger Rabbit's cartoon Spin, the only major presence the Weasels have had is the Fantasyland attraction, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. In case anyone asks about the live-action movie of the same name, although it was distributed on video by Disney, it really had nothing else to do with the company, and is generally not considered a Disney film. In fact, it was originally released in the UK as The Wind in the Willows, and it received its theme park-inspired title when Disney purchased the distribution rights. All that being said, it's a very charming movie, and I would definitely recommend it if you're in the mood for something fun. When Mr. Toad's Wild Ride opened with the rest of Disneyland in 1955, there were no Weasels or Winky. In fact, aside from a few statues and portraits seen in Toad Hall depicting Toad and friends, there were no recognizable Wind in the Willows characters to be seen. As many theme park enthusiasts know, Walt Disney wanted park guests to feel as if they were Mr. Toad, Peter Pan, or Snow White in the dark rides. Still, the Peter Pan and Snow White rides at least featured supporting characters from the films. Figures of Mole and Badger were apparently added around 1961, but no villains for the time being. In 1971, Walt Disney World opened with its own version of Mr. Toad, one that featured all the Wind in the Willows characters. Minus Toad himself, unless you count him being seen in the ride's queue and various statues in his likeness. This was arguably the best version of Wild Ride we may ever get, more crazy than ever, and with the added bonus of having two separate tracks. Depending on what line you got in, you could have two very different experiences on the ride. The left track has riders at one point driving straight through Winky's pub. Winky is seen holding two beer steins. Wide-eyed with surprise, he ducks under the bar, but leaves the steins cartoonishly spinning in midair. Of special note is his attractive barmaid, who bears a resemblance to a naked woman posing in a pinup hanging on the pub's wall. Yes, this was in the attraction, and it's one of the many reasons why Mr. Toad's Wild Ride is awesome. After scaring Winky, the riders pass through the warehouse behind the pub, where a couple weasels rush their boss's defense, swinging bats at you. The ride's right track had no Winky, but made up for it with thrice as many weasels. In this experience, riders drive into a police station rather than the pub. Naturally, they are corralled straight into a jail cell, one full of weasels. 
Amusingly, the weasels are in mid-escape, with one digging his way to freedom, and another holding a classic cartoon bomb, the kind Batman could never get rid of. Riders do the weasels a favor and drive right through the prison walls. But the cops are on the escapee's tail, and it's not long before riders drive by the police and weasels having a shootout. When Disneyland's Fantasyland was revamped in 1983, their Mr. Toad attraction was spruced up, with the weasels and Winky joining the fun. Due to space limitations, the only weasels seen are a couple swinging from chandeliers in Toad Hall. Winky is seen in his pub, repeating the spinning Steins gag from Disney World. Winky's expression here is not one of surprise, though, but rather that cheeky, devious look he sports in most of the cartoon. Of course, it wouldn't be right not to talk about the ride's unforgettable ending, where guests drive into an oncoming train and wind up in hell. It's the cherry on top of an already insane experience. I think the various demons encountered in the final scene count as minor but memorable villains, since demons are evil by nature. I love the design of these guys. Maybe it's their body proportions, but they remind me of an evil version of Figment the Dragon. I remember reading somewhere that the original idea for the ride was to have riders wind up at the Pearly Gates, accompanied by a triumphant heavenly fanfare before it was decided that hell would be a lot more fun. Unfortunately, I can't find the source for this, so if anyone has any information, please let me know. When the Disneyland ride opened, the entrance to Hell was a demonic mouth that formed a gate of sorts with a sinister welcome sign. Still, it was a bit more friendly than the classic Abandon Hope All Ye Who Enter Here message. This is Disneyland after all. The devils were made of plywood, like most of the props and characters seen in the ride. In 1961, they were replaced with rubber three-dimensional figures. Today in Disneyland, guests are welcomed to Hell by a demonic version of the prosecutor from the cartoon. The devils are also accompanied by a dragon-like creature who tries to breathe fire on guests, but ends up coughing and hacking instead. Similar devils were seen in the Disney World version, along with a larger green demon that popped out from behind some rocks to give guests one last start before they return to the outside world. Today, of course, Disney World's Mr. Toad ride is now a Winnie the Pooh attraction, and admittedly an enjoyable one, but it's nice to see that Toad Hall still has a place in California. And now for something completely different. Washington Irving's Legend of Sleepy Hollow tells of Ichabod Crane, a schoolmaster who begins teaching in a small town. Due to his eccentricities and charm, he becomes quite popular. Ichabod sets his eyes on young Katrina von Tassel. Not only is she beautiful, but she is an only child and her dad is loaded. Lusty, gold-digging Ichabod finds a rival in the town tough guy, Brom Van Brunt, better known as Brom Bones, who is also interested in Katrina. The rivalry goes on for a while until the night of a harvest party, where Ichabod plans to pop the question, securing his wife and wealth. Everyone swaps ghost stories, with Brom telling of the fearsome headless horseman, the ghost of a soldier who was decapitated by a cannonball. His skull was shattered by the blast, so his body was buried without the top part intact. The angry ghost is said to ride through the woods at night in search of his head. The only way to escape is to cross a bridge by a church where the horseman is buried as the ghost cannot cross it himself. After the party, Ichabod is rejected by Katrina, and sadly rides his old horse, Gunpowder, home. On the way, he encounters the Headless Horseman, and is chased through the woods. He makes it across the bridge, but when he looks back, the horseman throws what appears to be his own head at Ichabod, in actuality a pumpkin. The next morning at the bridge, all that is found left of Ichabod is his few belongings and a smashed pumpkin. Rumors abound of what happened to the schoolmaster, like him being taken by the ghost, or simply fleeing town in fear. Brom Bones marries Katrina shortly afterward, and laughs every time he hears the story about Ichabod, especially at the part on the pumpkin. The Disney version of the story stays pretty close to the original text, but with a lot of added slapstick. Ichabod is surprisingly not made all that sympathetic, and is fairly true to Washington Irving's interpretation. Despite his gawky appearance, Ichabod is actually quite suave with the ladies, who fawn all over him. His natural charisma and cleverness make him a worthy opponent for Brom Bones. Brom, like in the story, is something of a local hero, leading a gang of rowdy but ultimately harmless hoodlums. He's a bully, yes, but there have been much worse bullies in Disney cartoons over the years. He did at least provide some inspiration to animator Andreas Deja when it came to work on Gaston for Beauty and the Beast. Katrina isn't that much better a person herself. She's annoyed when Brahm scares away her potential suitors, because she was enjoying their slavish devotion to her. Most of the reason she indulges Ichabod is because it keeps the game going, and she can keep having her fun. 
Brahm is just as bad when it comes to playing on the emotions of the less conventionally attractive townspeople, as seen at the dance with Tilda. Hilariously, Tilda ends up being much more than Brahm can handle, and the woman completely steals the show for a few moments. Outside of the horseman chase later on, Tilda and Brahm's interactions at the dance are the highlight of the segment. Disney's choice to keep Ichabod as a selfish character, rather than a lovable, misunderstood nerd, is surprising. As I said in the previous entry, Disney rewrote a good deal of Bongo when adapting Fun and Fancy Free just two years prior to this movie, turning a bitter, cynical story into something much happier and easy to swallow. The characters of Ichabod and Brahm could easily have lent themselves to a similar treatment, and thankfully, Disney didn't make the obvious choice. The true villain of this story is, of course, the Headless Horseman, the ghost said to be so vile that the other demons in Haunts don't even like him. Fueled by his anger at being an outcast, not to mention his missing head, the Horseman is said to attack others in the dark woods at night, hoping to take their own heads for his own. Since he's still missing a head when we see him, we can assume he hasn't been successful yet, unless his previously stolen heads have rotted away. I don't know how the logistics work. Before talking about the ghost any farther, I of course need to address his connection with Brom Bones. The Washington Irving story heavily hints that the horseman is actually a disguised Brom, who tries and succeeds in scaring Ichabod into leaving town. His horseman encounter is a fairly brief chase, but it's effective enough. The Disney version, meanwhile, has a fantastic chase sequence, taking full advantage of the animated medium. There's plenty of hilarious slapstick moments, but the feeling that Ichabod is in real danger never subsides. The animators seemed fully aware that this was the centerpiece of the movie, and they delivered one of the best sequences the company produced in the late 40s. However, with the more elaborate horseman chase, it raises the question on whether or not this is Brom Bones, or an actual evil spirit. Granted, the Washington Irving story raises the same question, but the implication is made much more clear that the ghost is Brom, and the townspeople probably know this as well on some level, but they think that the horseman being real makes for a much better story. Disney's Horseman is much more openly sinister than the Irving version, who merely pursues Ichabod and throws a pumpkin at him. This one swings his sword at Ichabod's head at several points, coming very close to killing the schoolmaster. Brahm is ready to punch Ichabod earlier in the cartoon, but there's a big difference between taking a swing at someone and straight up killing them. He doesn't come off as the truly murderous type. Then there's the moment where Ichabod peers down at where the Horseman's head should be, and reacts in pure terror indicating that this ghost is the real deal. In my personal opinion, I think that it's Brom. Animators Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, who both worked on this movie, said that a lot of the forest scene is embellished by Ichabod's own fears, much like the similar scene in Snow White. I believe that while Brom might have swung his sword a bit, it didn't come nearly as close to Ichabod as it does in his mind, which is what we're seeing. That might also explain what Ichabod thinks he sees or doesn't see down the horseman's throat. Also, the horseman's red-eyed demonic horse bears enough of a resemblance to Brahm's own horse, Daredevil. Still, since the movie does not point us toward Brahm as being the culprit as much as the short story does, I can't draw any true conclusions here, and I'd say it's still up for the audience to decide. Brahm Bones, like most of the other characters in this segment, was voiced by the celebrity narrator Bing Crosby. While Crosby was the one to also sing as Brahm in the jazzy Headless Horseman song, it was suggested at one point that the deep voice throw Ravenscroft to the vocals. It was decided that, for consistency's sake, Crosby should sing that one as well. While this was probably the right choice for the movie, an alternate Ravenscroft recording was released on LP and can be found online today. It's definitely worth a listen. Meanwhile, the Headless Horseman's hideous cackles were provided by Billy Bletcher, who at the time was voicing tough guy characters like Pete and the Big Bad Wolf. The Horseman has not had many animated appearances since his movie, but he was naturally seen in the House of Mouse series, along with countless other Disney characters. In the previously mentioned episode where Pete hires the Weasels as waiters, the Horseman appears to do a gossip corner, but of course he can't share much due to his lack of a head. What's more interesting is the Horseman's presence in the Disney theme parks. Two early ideas featuring him were planned, but never materialized. When the Haunted Mansion was first being developed, it was planned as a walkthrough rather than a ride-through. One proposed plot was about a wedding between two monsters, with many classic haunts coming to the reception, including the Headless Horseman. His big entrance scene sounds like it would have been quite striking. Guests would have stopped in front of a large window looking out into the bayou. The Headless Horseman would have been seen galloping toward the mansion, 
as lightning flashed and wolf's howls were heard in the distance. When Disney World was being planned, new dark rides were considered for Fantasyland. Disneyland had a scary Snow White ride, a scenic Peter Pan ride, and a wild Mr. Toad ride. It was proposed that Disney World have a scary Sleeping Beauty ride, a scenic Mary Poppins ride, and a wild Sleepy Hollow ride. According to Imagineer Tony Baxter, guests would have ridden in a hollowed-out jack-o'-lantern. The ride vehicles would have spun around, much like the eventual Roger Rabbit attractions cars. Guests would pass through the Harvest Dance, where the dancing partygoers would have been spinning themselves. After passing Brom Bones singing by the fire, guests would leave the party into the haunted forest, where they would see the horsemen around every corner. In the final scene, guests would approach the safety of the bridge, but the ghost would appear and hurl his pumpkin head at them, complete with a bright explosion effect. When it was later planned to add a Liberty Square section to Disneyland, the Sleepy Hollow ride almost found a home in California, but alas, it never came to be. As interesting and fun as this ride sounds, the Mr. Toad attraction that ended up being built in Disney World was definitely something special. Since the mid to late 90s, the Horseman has become a Halloween staple at the parks, leading Mickey's Boo to You Halloween Parade in Walt Disney World. Over at the Fort Wilderness Resort, the Horseman used to appear to guests on a haunted hayride, and has more recently trotted out for photo opportunities on special nights around October. Although he's friendly to guests posing for photos in Florida, it's a different story over in Hong Kong. Hong Kong Disney has had some surprisingly scary walkthroughs for Halloween, feeling more akin to the haunts and frights seen at Six Flags or Universal. A haunted attraction called Revenge of the Headless Horseman was introduced in 2011, taking place at a creepy carnival. Someone claims to have recovered the missing head and has it on display as a sideshow. I can't find much information on the experience, despite it appearing seasonally until 2014, but it sounds like the horseman stalks guests through the carnival, trying to reclaim his head once and for all. One account mentions a gag where a Madame Leota-esque fortune teller's head in a crystal ball is encountered. However, the horseman has smashed the crystal, leaving the head gasping for breath, like a fish out of water. One of the most interesting appearances of the horseman was at a one-time special event in Disneyland called Mr. Toad's Enchanted Evening. Taking place on October 28th, 1999, I could only find a few low-quality photos of the event online, featured on the Disney site LaughingPlace.com. They had a couple links to other guest accounts of the event, and although the sites hosting those accounts are defunct, the Wayback Machine allowed me to access them and get all the details. It really sounded like a fun time. Guests could purchase exclusive merch and meet a few Disney legends, but the biggest thrills came when Ichabod Crane and Brom Bones showed up, which marks their only live appearance in a Disney park that I'm aware of. Brom and Ichabod would tell the guests fairy tales, with Brom focusing on the darker aspects and Ichabod on the lighter. At the end of each story, the respective hero would appear and lead everyone to their ride. In this case, of course, it was Peter Pan, Snow White, and Pinocchio. For Mr. Toad's wild ride, rather than have Toad himself appear, a judge auctioned off various Toad merch, including one of the ride vehicles. For an added special bonus, cast members appeared within the wild ride itself, dressed as police officers and devils. At the finale, Ichabod sat on the carousel and told the legend of Sleepy Hollow. The carousel slowly rotated as Ichabod recounted his ride through the forest. Suddenly, the carousel stopped when Ichabod's horse was out of sight, and the Headless Horseman rode by guests. When Ichabod's horse came back into view, the schoolmaster was gone, with only his hat and jacket left on the horse. Brom Bones, of course, finished up the story. As guests left for the night, the horseman made one final surprise appearance, throwing his pumpkin across Main Street. Given at how this event happened 20 years ago, and for a relatively small crowd, I'm not sure how much, if any, videos there are of it, but it sounded amazing, and I hope more pictures and footage will surface online someday. That wraps up this entry in our Villains Retrospective. As I said, it also wraps up the package films. Even if Ichabod and Mr. Toad was a lot of fun, the package film era is generally frustrating because everyone working for Disney knew they could be doing so much better. Thankfully, the next movie we're covering was a major success and a return to form. In our next entry, we'll be looking at Cinderella's step family, The Tremains. You wouldn't happen to have an axe I could borrow, would you? Thank you. I've had a lovely evening. 